Uh, Johnny Enoch was a he was someone I'm not really know, I don't know much about. I've heard his name. I've seen him a couple of times. Didn't know much about him. But he actually um, does a TV show called The Alaska Triangle, which um, I might watch because I've heard of the Alaska Triangle. I've heard like there's cryptids like the Nantinak, which is kind of Bigfoot-like creature, and things like that there, and a lot of other weird things that go there. And he says, you know, basically, he's a true believer in all this weird stuff. He says, within 10,000 light years of the Earth, there are 20 million solar systems. There's probably intelligent life somewhere in, in those. Um, he also said there's, I've looked into this, there's a crashed alien craft on the planet Mercury. There are runes on, in Antarctica and on the moon. Well, we know there are pyramids in Antarctica, and someone's found what looks like a pyramid on the moon. But it, um, some of the, the wealthy and elite of this world, they eat food that is not grown on this earth, which is supposedly much nicer than um, the kind of food that um, the kind of food that you get like um, on Earth. Of course, it's a matter of taste, I suppose. Now this is, I didn't know this, Elvis Presley was really into UFOs. He apparently encountered a mothership which beamed a blue light um, down onto him. Um, and and he, he likes, he, he's written a lot of songs with the word blue in the title, like blue suede shoes and things like that. Interesting about Elvis Presley, he, he was, he had an identical twin who was stillborn. And, um, I don't think he ever really got over this. I mean, some t some twins have this experience, don't. This may have contributed to his lifelong problems with depression and addiction. At Graceland, there is a memorial garden to his brother, Aaron Presley. Very sad. And George Hunt Williamson I've got to look up because he's, he's apparently based on Indiana Jones. Now, I remember when I was a little kid, I went through a phase when I wanted to be an archaeologist because I thought archaeology was Indiana Jones. <laughs> it was just not really, you know. Um, so, that's your Maria Wheatley. She's the female Indiana Jones, apparently. There are ancient star maps around the world as well, which, in the, which show not just, rather like the Betty and Barney Hill star map, but you find them in, in Sumerian and Egyptian temples. I think that's an interesting sort of thing to know. Now, I've spoken on a previous video about how there was some weird stuff going on in Antarctica. For example, Obama disappeared for a few days when he was on tour in South America. He went to Antarctica. Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, went to Antarctica. And of course, Buzz Aldrin, the, uh, the astronaut who didn't walk on the moon, but he did go into space. He went to Antarctica too. Um, so, what are all these people going to Antarctica at the same time for? Um, and now Obama in 2012, earlier, a few years earlier, went to Afghanistan. He was actually on his way to Australia on a tour and he stopped off in Afghanistan. And, uh, Jody said that maybe he was shown they found a Vimana in Afghanistan. One of these ancient spacecraft made in the times of the Vedas. They're described in the ancient Indian text, the Vedas. Now he did an interview with um, two guys. I mean, he he, he related a, a period where he did an interview with two guys. Um, now these are people Linda Morton Howe knew and put in, in, him in touch with, and he stopped off in on a, he went to visit them in, a, in Pittsburgh or somewhere like that. Um, no, I didn't know two guys. You see them sitting there. I recognise one of them. Um, there was one on the right. I don't know. There's one on the left that he calls Chris. Hello, how are you doing? It's all right, I'm just doing my little reportage. How are you? What you got there? Yeah, my signals bad, but I'm in your group, so to me, oh, when right. I get home, when I'm on my laptop, I love the pictures. Do you want to be on her Panmo TV? No, oh God. <laughs> okay, I'm just talking to somebody who knows me. She doesn't want to be on her pan. Okay, but but thanks very much. Cheers. Oh, you. Right. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's someone I just know from Facebook. Um, yeah. Now the guy on the right, I didn't recognise. The guy on the left, though, is has become quite infamous. He's a man known as Mr. Cooper. Um, and s some people have researched him, like S Stephen Cambion says that he's a fraud. Um, now, the thing is about Cambion thinks that he's, Cambion is kind of a, he's a, imagine Richard D. Hall, American with a sense of humour. That's Stephen Cambion. He thinks 
everyone's fake in some way or another, it seems. But, um, but I do, I do wonder, you know, because Richard Dolan did this interview with a guy and then said later on said he was, his story might not have been true. He was the dying man that Richard D. Hall interviewed at the old folks' home. But um, there's also um, Danny and Brinkley. Now, apparently, Danny and Brinkley, of course, is famous for being a near-death experience guy. He actually. He actually was declared dead and taken to the PM suite at a hospital and he kind of came, he woke up on the slab, which is a bit scary. He claims his near-death experience has cured him of psychopathy, which is doubtful. I don't think you can cure psychopathy, but I, I do believe that probably he was a pseudo-psychopath and was cured. That's quite perfectly possible. And Danny and Brinkley's now getting into the same sort of thing as John Enoch and Ancient Mysteries and things like that. And... Um, he went to. He went. He he's been on the road looking for these portals, these stargates. Oh, uh, Johnny! Johnny's wondering if there might be some kind of cosmic Atlantis. In other words, in the ancient world, there was sort of like um, real. There was real kind of like people. There was a real sort of network of people covering the entire world. A network of. A network of um, different planets. And, of, of different people, so people travel around everywhere, um, and these Stargates were part of it. Now, there's a film called Stargate, and it, of course it became a TV series. The original film by Roland Emmerich, I think, is actually pretty poor. It's it's a lousy film, but it's the idea behind it is fascinating, and it's worth watching, I think, just for that. But um, anyway, got to go back for the next speaker now. Break now. I, I actually, I actually missed most of the last speaker. That's Theresa Bullard White, because um, yeah, I'm with Derek again. Hello, Nick. Hello, me again. <laughs> I'll get you. I'm not a bad you know. He keeps coming up, yeah. But um, I've just done an interview with some guys, two guys on, who are on YouTube. Tim Wickstead. So check him out, Kim W I C K S T E A D, um, and his cameraman. He's got a separate cameraman, and I, and I actually it was actually um, someone else arranged for me to do a little interview with a uh, little interview with him. And hi, yeah, and um, it was very good. That's why they call Sorry. it spell. And, and it was very, very good. It's a word of um, power. They're, they're kind of very, they thanks. They're, they're very, so they very, um, words very, very, you know, they ask me some good questions. They clearly, really they clearly have a lot of interest in the subject. And, um, there is a time. I'll get this one for you. Right. Yeah. And, um, so we're just going to have a quick coffee now. But I missed most of the last speaker, unfortunately. She was just, I'll, get, I'll tell you a little bit more about her later, but I missed most of the talk because I was doing this interview. But I'm glad I did it. Now well, they've got two paramedics now. I'm heading back upstairs to, to see Hugh Newman. I've actually missed the beginning, but I had to get something to eat. I got some chicken curry. Um, I had to I had to get something to eat because I didn't have any breakfast. It's been like a it's been like a whole uh, it's been a pretty busy morning. I got like um, it's, and I, I spoke to a lot of people. Yeah, I did some interviews. Yeah, these these hello. Oh, this is my, I'm doing a YouTube show. Oh, brilliant. Good. So these are the guys I did an interview with. Um, okay. And I should advertise you as well. This is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My name's Tom Wickstead. Nice oh, to meet everybody. Right. Hope you're well. And you'll be on. You're on YouTube, aren't you? Yeah. And you're. Are you, are you involved as well? Yeah, I'm Harry. I am Harry. the cameraman. Yeah. No, oh, cool. Yeah. Well, check them out on YouTube, and um, you'll see, you might see my interview there as well. And you've been interviewing a lot of people around here today. So. You're doing a dual. Uh, yeah. This is, here we go. We're at the UFO conference. Yeah. Here's Ben. Ben, yeah. Yeah. Look at this. Hey guys. We're YouTube. We're doing YouTube. Mm. Got Harry here. Yeah. Harry's well. So it's been it's been a really really good weekend. I've really enjoyed it. It'll soon be all over, which is sad. But um, my goodness me, it's been fun. Yeah. There'll be there'll be others coming up. There's another yeah. one next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lots uh, of UFOs, mm. paranormal activity. Mm. We love it. It's cool. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks guys. I'm gonna just nip in here quickly, and then I'll go and see Hugh Newman. No. I won't show you the toilet. Okay, we've got an hour, hour's lunch break now, having a wander around here. Whoops, watch out for that. Don't trip over it. And, um, a lot of the stalls are un unoccupied at the moment. I think some, not all of them have been abandoned. But uh, some people are going to leave early. As you see, uh, that's huge stall there. Um, the Cosmic Disclosure team is done there. Billy Carson, he's just got some QR codes. So. You can um, just click those if you want to know more. There you go. 
on one of these energy categories as opposed to putting in something. Now, uh, Hugh Newman, he was... Um, the crop grow bigger? I, I had missed the start of his talk. I was just eating and talking and stuff like that. I missed the start of his talk. But he's an interesting sort of chap. Um, he's... Um, he talks about Stonehenge and about um, how it was... Um, firstly, it was, he said that it may have been cast using some sort of means of turning the stone into some kind of malleable liquid or some other form of matter and then casting it. Now, um, this reminds me of the stone balls of Costa Rica because he runs Megalithomania. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a theory that some people suggested that they found some way to cast ceramic, hard ceramics, which seems strange, seems incredible, especially when they could be reformed into the original form rather than some kind of igneous means. But, um, um, there was a... There are also there's legends of giants, and there's giants that built Stonehenge. They found giant graves. There's a grave apparently of an eight foot tall, tall person at Stonehenge, which is quite tall. I mean, Robert Wadlow was a foot higher, but uh, there's grave fourteen feet tall, which is considerably bigger. There's some graves of some ten foot tall people in Iraq. A whole collection of them and they're like oh, that's a foot taller than Wadlow and there's like 10 of these guys hey uh, how you doing and um, he, he went then talking about how the, these giants of legends are these giants were the ones that built Stonehenge and these other monuments also um, that they found a giant a grave on Lundy Island, which is an island in the Seven Sea. I refuse to use the term Bristol Channel because that's in, I'm Welsh. Um, and that there were similarities between Gobekli Tepe and Stonehenge, which is amazing because they're supposedly they've been built a very, very long time periods apart. Gobekli Tepe is far older. It's uh, well, twice as old, more than twice as old as Stonehenge. Stonehenge is estimated that the main construction was a 24th to 22nd century BC. The Techie is 90, 9, uh, 9, 600 BC. Um, but there are similarities. And again, you have this connection with giants. And that they have altered states. And there was a, there's the fee proportion, the golden mean, encoded into them. In the same way as you remember my video from York, that York Minster has as well. It's um, really astonishing. And apparently there's things called chalk, chalk drums that were found in this country. And they, I don't know if they're real drums, I don't think you can bang them. But they're called chalk drums, and they have like these spiral patterns on them. They're, they date back to around the time of Stonehenge. I've not heard of them before, I'll have to look them up. But it was very, very interesting things, very interesting stuff indeed. Oh, yeah, and I bought a copy of Paul Sinclair's book, which I'll show you in the souvenir session. So I'm now going to go outside and have a walk around outside, see what I can see. What I, can see. I think the paramedic is drinking on Jew Tree. Tut, tut. Mm. They've, got two, they've got two paramedics here now. I think they're, uh, there must be, uh, maybe it's like regulations in, in this city, in this town. But uh, it's in case people need first aid, I suppose. The crowd is so large that you could say that you need a, a considerable presence of like emergency services and things. And doing videos going up and down these escalators reminds me of Rawcon actually. If you remember that Rawcon was actually actually took place in a shopping centre. Um, and this has like I say this has this kind of atmosphere to it. It really, really does. There's some little panorama here. I'll just do some silent filming to give you an impression of what it's like here.
Giorgio Sukolos has just talked, he's still on his tour, but there's a lot of people queuing up to see him now. Um, he's the guy who, who gave out the Galactic Citizen Award yesterday um, and um, to, to, to Billy Carson. Um, he's, he's, I'm also personally giving him a Hapanro TV Award for the person with the hairstyle least like mine in the entire world. There he is. There he is. There but, um, he, um, he, he started off having to go with the flat earthers, telling him to get out, so a little bit of the Jarrell White there, I think, um, in him, but, uh, I mean, he said it in a kind of jocular way, it wasn't like, it wasn't sort of malicious, <laughs> and then, um, he talked about colonising the universe. Or, I don't know, it's a bit politically incorrect to say colonize, colonize you know, but you know, explore and things like that. Decolonize the galaxy! He said with, with a spaceship that go 2% the speed of light, with a centrifugal, centrifugal anti-gravity system, which I think I mentioned on a, a video once, I certainly read an article on Hapanwo TV about it. You can colonize the galaxy in 10 million years, just going from one star to another and 3D printing new spaceships. Well, you know that that kind of that's a kind of a bit of an obsolete way of seeing things because, because the actual they are genetically the actual to us, technology that's available by the deep state is, is way beyond that. We don't need centrifuges for anti -grav for, for artificial gravity, and we don't need like uh, rockets and things like that. We control gravity. You know, um, what's his name? Uh, Johnny Enoch reckons that. Uh, Man-made, back-engineered anti-gravity has now surpassed what the aliens have. I don't know if that's true, but it um, could be. He says these will be generational starships, so you, you get on them and you, you don't actually... They're in space so long, you don't get to the end of them. You just get on board the spaceship and your great-grandchildren will be there when the spaceship lands, which is a bit of a drag, I mean. I don't know how many people would volunteer for that. But um, more with their we'd be teaching teaching the aliens when we arrive, and we'd be like gods coming down from the sky if we're of a higher technology than them. Well, you know, this is straight out of Eric von Daniken's book, Mysteries of the Gods. He said that because he said you know, that um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now that is a quote by Arthur C. Clarke. I would expand it. I would say any any sufficiently advanced technology or a natural process humans don't yet understand or, or are incapable of understanding, if possible, um, is also indistinguishable from magic. Um, and, he, and he says that it'd be like a cargo cult. You know, cargo cults uh, emerge when um, the uh, indigenous people of the South Sea Islands, who had no contact with the outside world, first came across modern technology. And this happened mostly during World War II, when there was a massive military expansion into the South Pacific. <coughs> um, they, um, they suddenly, you know, they had no contact with the outside world, and suddenly these pale-faced, pale-skinned men suddenly landed on their island and started building airstrips, and planes were landing and things like that. It was a bit of a shock. And when those people left, the, uh, the, the indigenous people actually built models, in wooden models of aircraft, and they marched up and down with like wooden model, wooden fake rifles over their shoulder, like the soldiers did. Um, this is because they, they turned these things into a religion, because they didn't know what they were. And when explorers arrived on the scene, and later on after World War II, they had enormous trouble explaining to these islanders that what they, what these people were, who they were, 
and the kind of technology they had was actually not supernatural. It was simply more sophisticated versions of their own primitive tools. It was very, very difficult for them to persuade them of that. And he, of course, he's using an analogy, just like Eric Von Daniken did in his book. He's using an analogy that essentially is like if you reverse the roles. And it's like you apply that to you apply that to outer space. That's essentially what it'd be like for humans landing on a planet with a primitive culture. And of course, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe that's what the aliens did to us. Which is that I am consciousness. It's very Star Trek. It, it takes me all things. All roads lead to Star Trek. I mean, the thing about Star Trek is, is a very, 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 very intelligent series. It's very, very well done because. Kind of because it puts humans in the position of the aliens, and there's not many, many science fiction series that do that. Hello, Vinci. How are you? All right, just a thumb. All right. Okay, mate. Yeah. Um, and um, there's ancient, there's alien-like creatures looking in art, such as there's um, there's creatures which look like they're wearing spacesuits. Now, you could say, well. I've always sort of like not really taken that very seriously because spacesuits are kind of culturally specific. But he's just said that you find like spacesuit like clad creatures in all. Uh, it seems in all um, in all cultures around the world you find these spacesuit clad beings that wearing what looks like human spacesuits or diving suits. I mean, it could be diving suits, or it may be some just some sort of ritual costume. I don't know. There was actually something you can watch on YouTube. It's called Mysteries of the Gods, and it's a documentary based on Eric Von Daniken's book, and has an interview with Eric Von Daniken. And the the presenter is William Shatner. It was, it was made in 1973, I think. It's really old. I had an old VHS of it. Um, and William Shatner is the presenter. It's like a feature length documentary, worth watching, I'd say. And he had to, oh, he had to, he had to have a go at chemtrails. Um, Giorgio did mention like that some um, chemtrails weren't real. He had to say that. Let's see if I can get him in the background. There we are. Oh, there he is. Um, old Giorgio there, he had to he had to have a bit of a go at the chemtrails people, you know, which includes me. Now, um, he said, chemtrails are not real, you know, this, this is contrails, not chemtrails. I don't know why he suddenly brought up chemtrails. There was no real segue in his talk about this. And of course, you know why I think he's wrong there, don't you? You know why I think he's wrong, of course. Um, Jason, welcome to Cosmic Disclosure. Thank you so much for There seems to be some rather strange, very dynamic sculptures from South America of flying turtles, or it looks flying turtles. Um, yes. And these are like. Um, um, I'll give you a little bit of structure of how they work. And they have. They have well, it looks like human faces, or they're kind of smiling like the Joker. And um, they're very dynamic, you know, they're, they're, they're flippers and things like that going backwards. And. Um, and they have like strange faces, what looks like goggles on. And there's lots of other abstract art from ancient Japan and other places which appears to show people wearing goggles, like flying goggles. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and now I've noticed several people around here wearing a particular badge. You might have noticed that Mark Ollie was wearing it. It's like a little gold brooch. Now, these are what's known as the Quimbaya artifacts. Now, Quimbaya, the Quimbaya civilization was one which flourished in what is today Colombia, South America in the about the second or third century BC and um, thus among these there's lots of artifacts and there's a lot of the very this is what's interesting they're very naturalistic artifacts they show things like frogs birds lots of different animals they're human figurines and things like this all often made of gold or gold alloy among them are objects that look rather like let's see if I can find a picture of one somewhere so originally, if I find a picture of one, is everyone wearing a? Yeah, hey, Juliet, you're not wearing one of those little badges, are you? The, you're not. Okay. Um, is anyone wearing one? You're not, Maria. You're not wearing a Quimbaya badge, are you? By any chance? The, the little thing that Giorgio was talking about. The, all right. You'll have to look it up, read, look, viewers. But it's a. It's a badge, which look, and it, what says it, it looks like an aeroplane, it looks like a delta winged aeroplane. And some of them even have propellers. And it has like, it has like a delta wing, and it also has a, 
it has like, looks like a tail, like an aeroplane's tail, and a rudder, and elevators. You know, it's, it's remarkably like a an aeroplane. It's, was it a product of an ancient civilization? You, you, I mean, aliens tend to build aeroplanes, but they're beyond that. But um, but they were like. Um, there are things like um, come around here. Isn't it? Oh, this is nice, isn't it? This is very nice. Either it means they had some way of seeing the future, which I don't believe is possible. It's time travel paradoxes, even when it comes to information, let alone actual time travel. Um, traveling back, you mean that something would have to travel backwards in time in terms of information. Now, this is possi it's possible to create the illusion of backwards time travel in terms of information or physicality with the many worlds hypothesis. That is um, Everett's parallel universes theory and things like that and other people. Um, that's not literal time travel though. Um, that is a po possible explanation. It is a possible explanation. And there's also like, um, along with Quimbaya, there's other things in South America, such as mysterious stones, Puma Puma Punku. I've never been to Puma, Puma Punku. And there are... Um, so there are strange stones which have no they have, they have no scripture inscriptions on them or anything like that they're just which is black and they're made out of andesite very very hard rock and they've been cut perfectly and no one knows exactly how they cut because this is a culture that was still in the bronze age like ancient egypt it was still in the bronze age they didn't have iron tools they had bronze but they didn't have things like the lever or the pulley or the wheel and if you to cut andesite today, you need like a diamond saw. You literally need a saw which is cooled with water, with a flow of water and covered with zirconian diamond. Um, yes, yeah, so how did they cut them? I mean, Giorgio did some experiments related to that. You see. He did a few experiments. Here he is again. He did a few experiments related to um, this particular, this, doing these kinds of like tests on these various things, and. Um, they couldn't reproduce the effect. They could not reproduce the effect with modern technology. What does that tell you? And there were also H-blocks. He says these, these H-blocks of Puma Punku. This has got nothing to do with Australian women being imprisoned, by the way. These are literally andrasite, very, very t carefully shaped andrasite blocks. Now, what's weird is they fit together. It's almost like they're template, they're template building fragments, like bricks. Or like the wheat checks at the World Trade Center, which you then assemble into a larger structure. And again, how do you make them? How do they make them? How do they make them so perfectly? A culture which is still essentially in the Bronze Age, how do they make them so perfectly? These are valid questions. But the thing about it is, I think where he and so where he and von Daniken can go wrong. And is that they, as I, I said before about Van Daniken, there was a far better explanation for this, which is an anti-Diluvian human civilization, which is high technology. This doesn't mean we weren't visited by aliens. I, I believe we were. I believe there was open contact with extraterrestrials in the past. There are too many legends. There's too many. There's too much biological evidence in terms of DNA uh, for interbreeding and things like that. There's too much of that, which means we believe that there was actual open contact. Yet, I don't believe the a the, these aliens are directly responsible for the construction of these objects. Um, this is what I mean when I say that von Daniken has not aged very well. But he was, he, was a, he was a very, very good, he was a very good speaker. I must say, he's a good speaker. I don't, I've only watched a couple of episodes of Engineers, but I think he's, he obviously believes in what he's doing. He obviously is, 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 he's obviously passionate about the whole thing. He's not, he's not a grifter, you know, he actually, he, he believes in it. He believes in it totally. And, um, yeah, he's, he's, and I met him before, he seems a likeable chap, he seems down to earth. I met him briefly at this, uh, at this French restaurant place I went to. A French restaurant. A French restaurant in Blackpool, yeah. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? Yeah, a French restaurant in Blackpool is where they add frog legs to the candy floss. <laughs> but yeah, he, he was... He was, it was in the, he was near this hotel. Um, so now we've got, a long, we've got the long break now. It was going to be two hours. It, I thought Giorgio overran by 20 minutes, but no one had the heart to shut him up. <laughs> um, so now we're, uh, we're back. We'll be back um, 
It's five o'clock. So for the next speaker, who I can't remember what I can't remember who it is, but uh, I'm going to get myself another coffee and uh, and if I see anything of interest, I will film it. Look at this. This lady here has a Giorgio Sucolos doll. Sort yourself out. <laughs> which she, she puts in her bed every night. Oh no, I don't. She goes to sleep with it. It gives her nice dreams. <laughs> Aliens! Aliens! Oh my god, we've been invaded. Look. There are some aliens. And it's not Dex. Dex is no longer with us, sadly, so it can't be him. I try and get a look at him from the front. We have had in the scientific community so many explanations and human scientists say this is plausible. That's the next natural explanation. It's all nonsense. Just Real aliens there. Hey, take me to your leader. This is I Do you come in peace? As remarkable as the ancient Nazca Lions. Right, um, let's see if we can get a closer look at Richard, Richard Dosey. He is actually here. So we us have a look. For some reason I've got a yellow shadow. It's true. Look. It's weird. Actually have a yellow shadow. Well, I don't know how that works. Blue light up there, it's giving us yellow shadow. I'm not imagining that, am I? We'll see that soon. Oh, that's strange. Anyway, there's Richard Zoti. Let's see what he has to say. I'll say more about his talk later. No, I'm going to do a, a full breakdown. Yeah. It's, it's a... Yeah, I'm just fascinated by these yellow shadows here. Must be some effect of the light. Anyway, I'll do a full breakdown of Richard Doty's talk later, because there's a lot, a lot to say about it. It was, wasn't what I expected, no, I'm not that much. Anyway. There he is. The event is winding down a little bit now. Um, a lot of the stalls have been packed up. It's now 6 p.m. Uh, there's only a couple more speakers left. And um, I don't know whether I'm going to stay till the end or not, but I have tried to like about. Um, I might leave before the end, depends on what the others are doing. But I will certainly want to. Uh, Hello, Tony. Oh, hey, How man. are you? Are you alright, guys? Yeah. Enjoy oh, the right. show. Enjoy Rick Doty. Is it your input? Is this your uh, huge change from Rick Doty after hearing that talk? Um, I'll say more later, I okay, think. I'm, I'm sure. Right, Tony. Look here. I'm interested in hearing Following the camera. Sure. Following you, following you. But, um, <laughs> yeah. I'll be saying more about that later. I'm, I'm going to... I'll do a, I'm not even like, done a full review of the talk no, yet. Yeah. Well, it wasn't what I expected, put it oh, that that's, way. Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, Have you heard that before, that story? Mm -hmm. I, I was actually in the conference. It's all, a, it's all a lot quieter now. We've got like... There's nice paintings there. It is, even though the conference has still got to run until about half past ten this evening, um, things, are, things are slowing down now. Things are getting... Things are like getting a bit calmer. I'm just going to take a little stroll out here. How you doing? All right, yeah, I've like, enjoyed it, you enjoying it? Let's have a look out here. Let's have a look here. See if we find any unsuspecting people to interview. Probably not. This is where like, people come out and have a smoke and things like that. Are you all right? You can, come out, you can come out here and have a smoke and get some fresh air if you want. It's a strange building, it's kind of... It says Winter Gardens on it. You see, the event was listed on the Winter Gardens website, but technically, this is this is like attached to the Blackpool Conference and Exhibition Centre. It's attached to the Winter Gardens. So it's part, this is the old Winter Gardens building there, you see, this red brick thing. And you can even see on the inside, I'll show you it in a minute, but there's a little bit of... In fact, I showed you earlier, but you can see the red brick of the inside of the Winter Gardens. Okay, half hour break and then it's uh, the next speaker.
This is the old, let's see, this is actually the old wall of the, of the old winter gardens. The new building has been attached to the old wall, basically. So, uh, that's it. Amazing atmosphere in this place. It's really quite extraordinary. They, they, they have managed to create a, like a magical sonnet lumiere kind of performance here, which is really, which is really extraordinary. Um, I just saw a, a second performance by Eric von Daniken. Uh, I missed the first, like I said, but uh, this one was. Um, was like his others, it was like, he's like he, the things he brings up in the books. And he brings up some of the ancient mysteries, which are genuine. So, there really is a, there really is a strain, there really are some real questions that need to be answered. If you look at his Wikipedia page, <clears throat> they'll tell you again and again that uh, von Daniken practices pseudoscience, pseudo-archaeology, <laughs> And uh, everyone keeps slagging him off. Oh, look at that! Is there my eyes, my eyes are watering. I've got camera envy. I really have. Um, they'll say, for example, that um, there's no, there's no mystery when it comes to the the nomo. That is these gods that supposedly that some we're interacting with. The, the ancient peoples interacted with. So for example, the Dogon tribe of Sirius B. <coughs> the Dogon tribe of Sirius B. The Dogon tribe uh, they come from West Africa. And they said that they were visited by in in their distant past by creatures they called Nomo. And you could say this is just a mythology, it's just, it's just something they made up. But then um, when when when, when uh, explorers first reached the, the areas where they live and asked them where did the Nomo come from, they said there's a star that orbits Sirius B. It's another star. It's an invisible star. It orbits. So there's a star that orbits uh, Sirius, the, the bright star, the dog star, and it orbits it every 50 years. But it's invisible. They said, "Oh, fine." They made that up. Interesting little fantasy. That is until telescopes came along that could actually see Sirius B, and they suddenly realised that it was true. How do those people know? They were stone, they're essentially Stone Age people who had, who had not yet invented things like telescopes. There's, um, there's also the Antikythera mechanism. The Antikythera mechanism is a is a strange thing that was found near the island of Antikythera in the Mediterranean. Basically, uh, some explorers found. I think it was in the 60s this happened. They found a, um, the remains of an old ship that had sunk in around about the 2nd century AD. It was a ship from Athens. <coughs> and it had sunk in the 2nd century BC. Uh, but on board they found a load of some what looked like strange metallic artifacts. And when examined, they realized these crew consisted of more than 80 cogs. And when oh, it took a long time for the, the to be reproduced. In the end, it was actually it was only in very recent years, the last couple of years, the whole thing was like recreated. They realised it was a mechanical computer. It was a it was the kind of device that had only been created in modern times, from maybe the 18th century onwards or post Enlightenment. Yeah, you know, this was nearly 2,000 years earlier. And it had been found on this ship, on this ship that sank all those years ago. Where did it come from? Was there some secret mystery tool that created it? If so, why did they keep that technology secret? Why did they keep it secret? If they released it to the public, we could have had an industrial revolution at the time of Christ. I mean, now, God knows what it'd be like. Um, there's the Piri Reese map as well. This is a map that belonged to Admiral Piri Reese of the Turkish Navy. In, in 1812, it was discovered in the top Kappa Palace in Istanbul. It looks like an ordinary kind of navigational map that ships use until you realize it shows the coastline of Antarctica. 
Now, this was a map from the 16th century. Antarctica wasn't discovered until but until Captain Cook discovered it in, I think, the um, I think in late, eight, late uh, 18th century. It wasn't landed on until the late 19th century. Um, and it, not only that, it shows Antarctica without an ice cap. It's ice. The ice is, is not on there. Now, it was millions of years ago that Antarctica was free of ice. The actual true coastline was only discovered when, um, in the 1950s, when um, sonar scans were done of the, of the ice. The, the ice is like a mile thick. There's an Amazon tribe which also recreates as a part of a ritual a special dance where one of the one of the dancers dresses up as, an, as what they say is an alien. It's a large bulky creature with they have a what um, they made a costume of reeds. It looks a bit like a spacesuit. This is Mysteries of Gods. This is from the 70s, I think, mean, with William Shatner. They film out there as well. He repeats uh, the, the things that uh, Giorgio Sukolos said with uh, you know, the multi-generation spaceship. I think um, Sukolos, I think, because they're both in Switzerland, I kind of feel that um, Sukolos is kind of his... He's kind of adopted Sukolos, I think. They probably knew each other for a long time. There are caves under the pyramids. Now, Andrew Collins talked about this a long time ago in a previous talk I saw of his. There are caves under the pyramids that are full of water. The Sahara Desert looks dry, but it's not. It's only on the surface it's dry. There are huge aquifers underneath it, giant lakes. <coughs> this is what Muammar Gaddafi was going to to get the water out. He was going to take the water from these lakes and irrigate the land. There was enough water in there to irrigate the, his country, Libya, and make it a, a green and pleasant land for up to 15 years. And he kept repeating the spirit of the times. He says the spirit of the times has to change. And um, that, of course, is the literal translation of the word zeitgeist. The German word zeitgeist is spirit of the times. Um, he speaks English, but he, he has a, he, had, he struggled over a few words. I think, and and um, he had. Um, his accent is strange. I don't know if you, Swiss people are hard to understand. It's a very different. It's a distinct, different accent to, to German, the German accent. Um, so even a, a non-German speaker can spot it. Um, Switzerland has does technically has a language which is technically German, but it's a very, they have several unusual dialects, um, some of which are incomprehensible to a, a German speaker from Germany. But it, I found that very interesting. But like I said, I've said before, a lot of the evidence that he's discovered in his series of books he's been writing since the late 60s. It was Charities of the Gods that I read at school, the first one. Um, Despite the fact he's right about alien visitation, he may even be right about human alien hybrid hybridization. The, I can't accept, and it doesn't make sense, that this explains all the historical anom anomalies. It's far more likely that this contact came and went, and then there was an antediluvian civilization of high technology. Well, and that accounts for things like the Piri Reese map and the Antikythera mechanism. That more than these things being direct creations of extraterrestrials, in my view. But it's interesting to hear him. I've never seen him live before, and it was interesting to see him live. Very glad I saw that. I want to show you these. There's a guy at Awaken Evolve trying to send their guy.com. But look at this. Look at this. This is from War of the Worlds, I think. Oh, that's scary, isn't it? And here, of course, we have the extraterrestrial highway. Yes, with a, a Meyer-esque disc above it. Was that a Bob Lazar disc? Wicked. Let's get a good shot of these back here. Brilliant. And let me get my phone. I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'll explain it all right. later. This okay. is a wonderful moment. I'll grab my phone. I'll get it onto the photo.
Wow. Basically, so Emma just morning. proposed to Dave on stage. <laughs> it's, it's a lovely story. No, very romantic. I just left uh, the auditorium now. After the memorial, I decided, to, well, we've all sort of arranged with the others to go. But there was no break between that and the next feature, so we basically, there was no, you know, it was not even a leg stretcher, so we just had to sort of like push our way out, which is a bit embarrassing. But um, yeah, we've just gone through the memorial of, of people who passed away since the last, uh, they, they do this, and there was a sort of like a little session where they had lovely pictures of them and, and um, Bob Brown, organiser of the big conference in America, the Congress, he read their names out and um, it, was, it was really, uh, there's some people, including people like Ian R. Crane and Timothy Beckley who I really knew. Um, Timothy Beckley, of course, I was on his show about four times and um, Steve, that was very good. I was, I was really moving. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, mate. Got a few Appreciate like it. That, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I was really. Yeah. I was really. I knew I Timothy awesome. Beckley. Yeah. Because yeah. I was like, I was on his I was show. Like, a bit all I know, mate. Like, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's understandable, isn't it? Possible. You know, this is part of our family. They're yeah. part of our, of our family, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Timothy, um, Timothy Beckley, I was on his show loads of times. He was a lovely chap, Ian R. Yeah. Crane. And... Yeah, it's hard to do. And it was, Bob was hard. He was joked every day. Yeah, he was. wanted to do it. Yeah, but yeah, thanks very much. He, he knows all. <laughs> I'm going to have to head off, but uh, it's right, been right. absolutely brilliant. I'm glad you I've loved every minute of this, man. I've loved every minute of it. Thank you so much. Yeah, you going to be our next one, yeah? Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. I haven't got the ticket yet, but I will. No problem. But uh, thanks for everything, mate. Thanks for everything. Thank you very much. See you. you t take care. All the best to you and the others. That was a, just saying goodbye to Steve there. Yeah. Um, it was a. It was um. It was sad, you know. They mentioned Ian R. Crane's there. Gareth Davis wasn't on the list, but then I, I suppose Gareth is. Um, Gareth was not as well known. It's, you know, I'm sure it wasn't an omission, a deliberate omission on their part. I'm certain. You know, you can't. You can't you can't get everyone on there, um, but, uh, but it was obviously it came just after that, you know that uh, there was Emma and Dave. <laughs> Emma, it's unusual like to well for a woman to propose in the first place of the couple, but then it was um, and it was on stage. It was, that was so romantic that was, and of course he said absolutely yes. Yeah, that was that was lovely. We're just going to wait for the others now. We're going to meet up and then we're going to head off. Um, it's been a great. I'm not going to stay for the end because it won't finish till very late. So. Well, that's it. I just uh, I just come out of there for the last time, so that's the end of this particular conference. It's uh, right now. I'm I'm just waiting for we can wait for a couple more friends, but basically it's now uh, the post conference blues for a while. But that's that's normal. That's normal. That's because. That's, uh, that's because it's a good one. I wouldn't feel that way if it wasn't a good conference. Um, just say goodbye to Jackie and, uh, and Lynn and Pandora and Chris and Steve, as you saw. I just, um, it's been really good. It's been a really good event. There is another awakening, but it's not for 14 months. It's August 2023. So, um, long time to wait. I can't even think that far ahead. I mean, there's been tickets on sale. I haven't bought one. I guess. I'll buy one close to the time. I can't make plans that far ahead, but of course um, I'm speaking at Miles's conference in a couple of weeks. The bases at Freedom Network International Conference and Workshops. I'm speaking at the Dwarf Earth Mysteries groups. So I've got two presentations to prepare for, but just wait for our friends now, and then we're going to head off and and uh, paint the town red, or whatever colour the illuminations are this year. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're now on Topping Street. They actually have a street in Blackpool named after our tone. Good old tone. Hey, Tony, if you're watching, mate, you're famous. You're so famous, you have a street named after you. One person I never reviewed. What's that? It's all right. Teresa, yeah, what, one person I never reviewed uh, was Dr. Teresa Bullard White. The White. And the reason was that I was out of the room nearly all the time doing those interviews. Um, so I didn't see much of her talk, but she did say something, the only bit I remember of her talk and the only bit I wrote down in the notes was I remember clearly she said something very interesting about the Hebrew script, the 22 letters of the Hebrew script are 
modelled on, on constellations. Now I've heard this before, um, it's extraordinarily if true, but it does appear that they do, they have been linked to a number of constellations in their appearance, which um, adds to the idea that Hebrew was, that, which is the language of the Bible and of the Holy Land, is actually a constructed language created for esoteric purposes. And indeed there is such a thing as colloquial Hebrew, it was revived. See, it wasn't actually a spoken language until the Zionist movement of the 20th century. Um, it was rather like Latin, it was sort of spoken as a sort of ancient, um, what's the word, ritual language, like Latin does it is in the Vatican, as um, no one actually speaks it, it's just, they, some people can speak it and use it for like ritual purposes like mass, and Hebrew was basically that. But um, when, uh, when the Zionist movement began, and eventually when Israel was created, and, um, it needed an official language. And, it's, and it, sometimes you know, nations will actually create a, 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 um, what's the word, a, have a language, they'll adopt a language or even invent one. And um, so Hebrew was, was brought into the, was brought revived in the same way that Cornish has in Cornwall as a colloquial language and it is today the official language of Israel and I know people who speak it in their everyday life you see them on social media just speaking it in their everyday life um, Israelis um, the Ashkenazi Jews in other words come from all parts of the world um, and they have their they often have second languages of their own um, for example um, Avi Loeb the Avi Loeb the famous pr professor from Harvard who is open-minded about UFOs he comes from Bulgaria his family comes from Bulgaria and no doubt he speaks Bulgarian yet as an Israeli he'll, he, his first language will probably be Hebrew um, and then it's remarkable to think that that language, language script at least was built on star constellations I mean it says an awful lot about the history of, of the uh, of the history of the of spiritual, spiritual traditions in our, in our world. We're just trying to find our, trying to find our meal now. Where we're going to go for dinner? It's a place called Tandoori. We're going to have a curry. Very, very traditional, I think. So here we go. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is Monday morning now. It's just gone six a.m. and I just got up uh, to go home. Um, I just uh, texted Tad. He's up as well. Honestly, that guy could be a hospital porter, I swear. And, um... I didn't do any more filming last night. But basically, because basically we just went and had dinner in the curry house. I had a very nice curry. And uh, then... Then I just walked back to the hotel. And it's windy. It was too windy, really, to film on the journey. And... And so, I just came home. And I just went to bed because it was quite late when I got home. But, um... Basically, I've, I've thought of a title for this particular film, which is rather unusual, and um, I'm going to call it A Streetcar Named Stargate. And now you might think that's that's an unusual title, why are you going to call it that? Um, I'm, I'm, well, it's all to do with, it's based on a streetcar named Desire. I think I might have talked about this earlier in the film, I can't remember. I can't quite remember exactly. But I do repeat myself in these videos, I know, because I don't have an approved script, this is like a video diary. And sometimes, you know, I repeat things in like you do in a real diary. But basically, A Streetcar Named Desire, it's based on A Streetcar Named Desire, which is a play by Tennessee Williams. It's a typical piece of kind of 1950s, a kitchen sink drama. Um, American, unusually, rather than British. Um, most kitchen sink drama was written like, by people like Harold Pinter. In that era, um, but Tennessee Williams was American, lived in New Orleans, and um, the title of the play is, is was chosen kind of randomly because he used to sit in the, he used to sit in his front room looking out at the street when he was writing, and um, a bit of trivia I learned this from Stephen Molyneux, and um, your trams used to go by. Now, in somewhere in New Orleans, there's a place called Desire, a district or a street or somewhere, which is also a tram terminus. And so as the trams used to go past, they would have the, the destination plate on the front, as they do, which said, um, Desire. And so Tennessee was sitting there thinking, oh, I'm going to call this damn play. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a play, just basically a piece of domestic bliss, a piece of domestic bliss, really. Um, it's about a young couple 
who uh, living together somewhere and then the wife's sister comes to stay and the wife's sister is a rather over the top high maintenance strange person and, and that's how the story develops and she's a really difficult person but the, the, the point is that um, he couldn't think of a title for it and he says he sees these trams going past with the word desire on their destination plate and he thought I know a streetcar named Desire. Streetcar is a word Americans use that means a tram. And so a streetcar named Desire. Now, the trams in Blackpool go past, and they, or when they go north, they say something like Bispen or something like that, or Fleetwood, because they're going north. When they go south, they, they, all, they, they often, they usually say Stargate. And the reason I say, now Stargate is a bit of a running joke, which I, which I actually brought up the very first time I went to probe. Because the very first time I went to probe, I got the, I got the coach to Blackpool, and then I caught a tram to Stargate. I remember. <laughs> um, and it's just Stargate, of course, Stargate. Um, it's S-T-A-R-R and G-A-T-E. Um, it's the last stop on the tram uh, going south. And Stargate is basically the, the southern extremity of Blackpool. You get, like, there's a big terminus for the tram, and also there's, there's the big shed where they, all the trams are stored. And... Um, And then there's that big long road through the dunes leading to St. Anne's. So I, I so I'll call this a streetcar named Stargate because the trams going south have that word Stargate on their destination plate. Mm. So that's uh, that's what I'm going to call this, I think. Now I should I've been putting this off because it's going to take a lot of explanation, but I should talk about Richard Doty. Now Richard Doty surprised me. Um, his talk was not what I expected. Um, but he, he immediately, I expected him to sort of start, I expected him to launch into some kind of um, explanation. No, I expected him to launch into some kind of weird list of anecdotes about aliens escaping and all kinds of other weird stuff, the kind of things he tends to talk about nowadays. Um, Area 51, this happened at Area 51, that happened at, over here in Papoose Lake. There were these strange creatures with six eyes and two ears coming out of the coming out of the ground near the near the gate at Nellis Air Force Range and things like that. Uh, he didn't. He surprised me by saying, I'm going to talk about Paul Benowitz. I mean, is he going to repeat the confession he's made several times over the last few years? This is a, it's, he said, I'm going to bring out information I've not told you before. And I thought, blimey, this is a global exclusive. I mean, there's actually no, there's no reason for him to do that because he has been caught red-handed. And he has confessed. It's a very sordid affair. It happened a long time ago. It happened before I actually was seriously into UFOs. It happened when I was a kid in the 80s. Now, a lot of people, of course, at the conference would be too young to remember that. But so was I, really. But I, I think people tend to have short memories, don't they? People, uh, you know, even within the alternative community with people who really should know better, they... They tend not to. I mean, so there's still some people like who just go and they've forgotten all about 9/11. It's like, was it that song by uh, old uh, FKN News, Dick Jackson? 9/11's a lie, but we don't care. It's just another part of history, and you know? it's just another part of history. The world moves on to a different news cycle. Things that happened just a couple of years ago are forgotten. At the moment, you see. Sometimes governments do this deliberately. Right now, they're very, they're very carefully and very subtly, but also very desperately trying to bury the COVID-19. If they're successful, literally in three years' time, people will say, lockdown? What was that? We have lockdowns over food shortages. What do, you, do you mean we, we once had a lockdown about a disease? Did we? Did we have a lockdown over a disease? <laughs> people will literally be that obtuse and that, and that unaware, that unconscious. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> he, the Benowitz affair, it's a sordid story which I should go into detail about if you've not heard about it before. I mean, the best, probably the best, the best summary can be found in, ironically, uh, by a US UFO skeptic, uh, Mark Pilkington. He did a, um, a, documentary called, a documentary called Mirage Men. Unfortunately, that documentary is not available anymore, although it is floating around in a few illicit places, 
which I can guide you to privately if you want me to. I mean, it's not actually on sale anyway, so I don't think there's anything immoral about that. It's actually off off the market, so we're not. Um, it's not really piracy. Um, but uh, there's also a book. It's worth reading the book because the book is a lot better than the, the documentary actually. Um, Paul Benowitz was a, a guy. He was a he was a businessman from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Another American, of course. For whatever reason, this is always centered on the United States. And um, he, he, he began, he was very into UFOs. He was a respected member of the community, he was patriotic, he was a World War II veteran, he was a loving father and a wonderful human being, as Richard Doty calls him. Um, and um, he became friends with Richard Doty because he started picking up strange signals from um, the nearby Kirtland Air Force Base which he was convinced were aliens trying to infiltrate that this uh, this military compound and he called he did what a, a, a law-abiding citizen would do he called the police the police then called the the Air Force and um, they sent round someone from the Air Force Office of Special Investigation who happened to be Richard Doty uh, Richard Doty went around and investigated and he was ordered to carry out a um, um, a counterintelligence operation against Paul Benowitz. Doty says this without any shame. He says this was he was just a, this was his duty. He was ordered to do this, and like a good soldier, he obeyed those orders. And he, without shame and without any guilt, he stands by that today. You know how many how much evil has been done in this world by by people who shrug their shoulders and say, "Just doing my job, mate. Just doing my job." It's not just soldiers. It's it's everyone who works within institutions and in a sense th th that kind of relieves them of any responsibility any accountability for their actions it doesn't I mean I'm just coming to I'm actually still coming to terms with what I did during my 23 years in the NHS because I I'm probably responsible for more deaths than most people probably even people in the military I'm still coming to terms with that. Um, so he did. He carried out this counterintelligence operation against. And what? Now this is. He actually said, "Well, they decided basically to encourage." I mean, they could. There's many ways you could deal with this. You could, you could take, you could do the respectful thing and take him to one side and just say, "Look, <laughs> Paul, just don't say anything about this, all right? What you've picked up is something classified. I can't tell you what it is." You know I can't talk about it, you're not briefed in. Please, could you just not tell anyone? You're a patriotic American. Could you please just stop talking about this? It's not UFOs, it's something else. That would be the respectful thing to do. I think that would be the sensible thing to do. I mean, that's kind of what they should have done with Helen Duncan, really. Well, luckily, they didn't lock Paul Benowitz in jail, although I'm sure if that had come up, you know, Doty would have done his duty there as well. But then... Um, they decided they decided to encourage Benowitz's belief in UFOs and encourage him to, to to find more and more UFO evidence and to talk about to to spread the word about that. And pretty much Benowitz pretty soon became obsessed, and um, this eventually led to madness. As he eventually lost his mind. As possible, I mean, this is not this isn't one hundred percent Doty's fault. You know, mental illness can have many many. Sources. It's unlikely that he wouldn't have had some mental problems if it hadn't been for this. But this didn't help. This didn't help at all. Far from it. And so eventually he died. Paul Benowitz eventually died. This happened a long time ago. This happened in the I think it was mid mid nineteen eighties. Um. Now. Then it all ties into Bill Moore. And William Moore wrote. William Moore was an amazing chap because he wrote the first definitive book about Roswell. It was published. In, it was actually he co-authored it with Charles Berlitz of all people, the guy who writes um, travel guides and um, and language phrase books. He co-authored it which, with Charles Berlitz, and it was published in 1980. And all subsequent Roswell books are based on that one. I've, I've got, I've actually got a copy. I've got a first edition paperback. I've read it. I've actually read it um, quite a number of years ago. Um, and it was another copy I had then. 
and it's it's a remarkable story. I mean, it cut. You'll be familiar with most of it if you're familiar with the Roswell story. It contains a bit of extra information that you don't actually get in more recent books. So if you get hold of a copy of it, it's worth doing. It's out of print, but there's loads of cheap second-hand versions going around. Um, Bill Moy, he was... Bill Moore was also targeted by... Um, by a disinformation campaign that was really very, very sinister and very... What happened was, um, basically, around the same time, or slightly earlier, a few, couple of years before the Benowitz affair began, Bill Moore was like, was a uf he was a ufologist. Um, of the t he was one of the main ufologists of the era. And he was approached one day by a group of people who met him in a pub or a restaurant somewhere, calling themselves the Aviary. Um, they had code names like Falcon, Condor, yeah, all our different names for birds, and um, they made it. They they said they represented a group of people within the elite who wanted disclosure. They were fed up with the truth embargo and they wanted disclosure. They they, they fed up. They knew they had lots of government secrets. And they fed up with government secrecy on extraterrestrial life. They were and they wanted to. They wanted to go public with it all. And they just they had decided that Bill Moore was the man. He was the man to do it. And what's more, so he was, they appealed to his ego, you see, they say, we think you're the best guy around, you know, we want you to be that. And what's, what's more, you know, we're going to make you Mr. Disclosure. You know, you work with us, and you'll be the guy who brings forward Disclosure finally, and you'll be the one who goes down in history as the one who brought Disclosure to the world. And they, they, and they said, and they said, oh, cool, that's great. And to be honest, if I was in this position, I would have, I'd have been quite pleased by that. I've got an ego, I'm not immune. However, some people have egos, others, it's their ego that has them. You see, then, then they said something that should have made uh, a red flag rise up in Bill Moore's mind. They said, yes, but in, in return, what we need you to do is, could you provide us with intelligence on individuals within the UFO community? We need you to provide us with intelligence, give us some insider details on their lives, and... We're also going to give you a few fake stories to put into the UFO world, which we want you to disseminate. If I'd been, I swear, if I'd been in, you may, you may doubt this, but I, t I promise you it's true. If I'd been in more shoes at that point, I'd have walked out. But Moore, of course, agreed to this, um, this plan by a these strange, suited, mysterious men in, uh, sitting around the table in this restaurant. One of them was almost certainly Richard Doty. Um, and so he agreed. And the, now, when you, it, it was a devil's bargain. And whenever you, whenever you make a devil, whenever you make a devil's bargain, the devil doesn't pay up. They, the Avery spy, they, it was basically created essentially a spy ring within ufology. Avery, they never, they never, they never actually um, kept their side of the bargain. But more, more worked for them. He made in, in the 1980. 1989 MUFON convention, he made a full confession on stage. There's a, there is a video apparently, there's a poor quality VHS of this going around. I can't find it anywhere online, but clips of it are in the Mirage Men film. Um, now, um, funnily enough, um, Doty also made an attempt to recruit Linda Moulton Howe. Um, in fact, um, Linda was interviewed by Mark Pilkington for the film. She describes how he, she basically, they basically came to her in exactly the same way. Now, Linda luckily had her head screwed on an awful lot more, an awful lot better than Bill Moore, and she didn't fall for it. But, um, apparently, um, so that, that's, it, it's amazing how much effort the government goes to. Isn't it? It's amazing how much time, energy, money, resources, and effort they spend in dealing with something which they say doesn't exist, or until not, until 2017 they said didn't exist. If we really were all delusional, chasing a fantasy, why not just leave us alone? Leave us to it. Uh, anyway, um, so that was it. Um, so they decide this is what they decided to do. It's a strange, 
it's a strange situation because like you want to know well this is this comes into my more general comes into my more general criticism of this whole idea and I've I've I've, I've um I've criticised others because this is this idea you know that um, what they did to Paul Benowitz they said let's let's encourage him to talk about aliens and then the real secret will be covered up the real secret Doty actually said on stage is that at Kirtland Air Force Base there was a an anti satellite weapon a, a ground based laser which could destroy or damage Soviet spy satellites. I looked this up actually, I can't find it anywhere. There wasn't, a, there was actually the Russians actually, um, the Soviets and, and did this in the Cold War. They worked on this. The Americans worked on land based anti satellite laser weapons, um, but they did have a project a few years earlier. It was actually cancelled in 1977. The, the, all current research since then has been on satellites, you know, space based weapons, space. Um, the weaponization of space and um, sat anti satellite laser weapons in space. Ground based lasers um, have. I can't find any reference to them anywhere, so I don't know what Doji's talking about when he said there, were, there was a gr ground based laser weapon at Kirtland, unless it's still classified for some reason. If You've got to ask the question why. Um, but it's a very, very it's actually a very fashionable idea right now, you know. UFOs, all the whole UFO, now this was the, the the entire central thesis of Mark Pilkington's book and his film. It was actually a brief segment in one of Adam Curtis's documentaries about this. I think it was hypernormalization. It's about one hour in and there's a little segment on this. UFOs really, if they exist at all, they're just they're a fleeting rare phenomenon that sort of disappeared sometime in the mid 20th century that's the idea either they either they're not real or that's what they are and that um, the entire entire modern UFO phenomenon is simply an engineered piece of neo mythology created by intelligence agencies designed to launder their more down to earth secret operations spy planes human intelligence um, gathering extrajudicial renditions and stuff like that which of course alien abductions are the cover for things like that it's it's a very fashionable idea right now but it doesn't work for several reasons it it's actually a very risky gambit to draw someone's attention towards something with the ultimate objective of deflecting it away it could backfire in any number of ways I think it can be dismissed on theoretical grounds for that reason it's it's rather like it's rather like two bank robbers rob a bank this is a good metaphor I think the one bank robber takes his stash in his, into the middle of the woods, buries it under a tree, um, makes a note of what the tree looks like and where it is secretly without writing it down, and then just goes back, goes back out of the woods and doesn't tell anybody. The se second bank robber dresses in a stripy shirt, a cloth cap and a mask and a mask over his eyes, and he, every time a police car drives past, and he stands on top of where he's buried his money, his, his stash, and every time a police car drives past, he waves his arms in the air and shouts, Excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Policeman, Mr. Policeman, just to let you know, what? Well, yeah, yeah, me, just to let you know, there's no money buried here, just some unicorn bones, okay. Which of those two men is going to get caught first? Which of those two men is going to be uncovered first? Which of those two stashes of cash is going to be found first? You guessed that. This is essentially what what um, and then there's many Richard D. Hall has now gone down this route. He, like many mistakes he's made, he's actually gone down this route big time. It's it doesn't make it's really. I think we're looking at an elaborate double bluff here. Um, I don't think Mark Pilkington is actively involved in that, but I think he's been taken in by that, and so was Richard D. Hall. Um, he's like many things he's been taken in with recently. Um, So that's what they did. They decided to encourage Paul Benowitz to talk about to talk about his alien aliens at Kirtland Air Force Base. So that the real thing that was going on at Kirtland was was actually um, was not was not actually exposed. Um, you see, by that by that logic, you could. I mean, there's another perfect example, a real life example, is that. Um, by that logic, you could argue that maybe Bob Lazar is, uh, was working for the... And in fact, Richard D. Hall said this rather stupidly. Um, after he waved his magic wand and brought in Peter Hyatt, the, the statement analysis guy. Um, 
Bob Lazar is, is basically a disinformation agent and he was put out there to talk about aliens at Area 51 to draw people's attention away from Area 51 you see, see what the problem is no one no one had heard, heard about it no one had heard about Area 51 before Bob Lazar well people had heard about it but it didn't get very much attention Bob Lazar turned Area 51 into a cultural phenomenon and now it's a major tourist attraction UFO sky watchers go there all the time but you see thanks to Bob Lazar it's not just UFO buffs who go to Area 51 aviation buffs too too they do as well which means that the very people who according to this theory the governments are trying to deflect their attention away are the very or also going to Area 51 you couldn't make it up as they say I'm going to try and have some coffee. I've got no sugar. I'll have some coffee without sugar. Oh, I've run out of sugar. I've got these little pots you get in Travelodge. There's never enough in them, is there? There's never enough in them. As I found out in Hull. Luckily, I, I, I'm not trapped in it like I was in Hull. So, um... Uh, they, you see, Doty also said... He said, um... He, made, he came up with two separate claims to uh, to try and explain what was really going on at Kirtland Air Force Base, which is rather strange. He also said um, he also said it was it was it was this anti-satellite thing, this laser, which according is still classified or doesn't exist, and it was also guess what? It was also drones. It was that, and it was, and it was, it was both this and drones. How can it be both? Apparently, it can be. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> um. Oh, pardon me. So then it gets a bit more complicated because he then discovers that the NSA, his group at Afosi, are doing their own. <clears throat> their own trick on Paul Benowitz. Then he found out the NSA are also spying on him separately and no one told them. Which sort of put his nose out of joint a bit. Messed up their operation. <clears throat> but then it gets a bit weirder because he starts talking about things which um, I'd not heard of before. <clears throat> he starts saying... He said... When he was one day when he was in um he was he <coughs> he was one day when he was at Paul Paul's house they became friends I mean his job was to essentially make friends with Paul Benowitz and sort of schmooze him that was his duty he was a kind of a, a non-sexual honey trap I suppose you could call it and um, he said orbs appeared once he was actually in he was in the sitting down having dinner or something with Paul Benowitz and or well, they were interviewing him with his assistants, and orbs started appearing in the room, like ball lightning. Um, I mean, he's never talked about that before. <clears throat> he also said um, something strange happened with his computer monitor. Uh, Benowitz had this personal computer, which were quite crude things in those days compared to today. Um, and um, he had a black and white monitor, which is quite common. It's quite common in those days to have computers which couldn't produce colour images on the monitor. Um, and it was just like a um, black and white monitor. And this colour image of an alien's face with a kind of rough, a kind of medieval rough um, as a, at the top of its suit around its neck. You know those big white things that they used to do, do in, that you see in the old paintings? He had one of those on and he had a strange suit on and he had like strange... A strange grey-like alien face appeared on the monitor in colour. In those days, you couldn't take screenshots, so he took a photograph of it and he showed the photo. Um, I, haven't, I didn't take a photo myself. Um, a lot of people were taking photos of the screen, the, the display screen with a slide on. Um, I didn't. You probably find a copy of this somewhere. Um, basically, because I'm, I didn't think it was worth doing. Um, basically, because I don't believe him. <laughs> Um, and then he said, um, then it, cause it wasn't just the, NA, the NSA was interfering with this, according to Doty. 
he finds out, he asks, he asks if there's anything strange. So he, they take the computer and the computer monitor in for examination. They can't find anything wrong with the machine. <clears throat> they take it into their IT experts, and there were a few of those in those days. Can't find anything wrong with it. They take it back, they take it back to Benowitz, and Benowitz says, well, where did you get this computer monitor from? Is there something, you know, how come it had this on? He says, oh, J. Allen Hynek and Leo Sprinkle gave it to me. <laughs> J. Allen, J. Allen Hynek, of course, is the uh, leader of Project Blue Book. Leo Sprinkle is a ufologist. He actually died. He was, he, was in, he was one of the people in the Memorial Hall of Fame. He died last year at quite an old age. Funnily enough, I came across a poster. on You can find, see, I actually retweeted it. <clears throat> for a UFO conference from 1966, and Leo Sprinkle is one of the guests. He's been doing this for, he did this his whole life. And so, Doty then went and, and talked to J. Allen Hynek and said, where did you find this, where, where did you get this? You get, he, they gave, basically, those two guys gave the monitor as a gift to Paul Benowitz. Doty then went and spoke to Hynek and said, where did you, get, where, where did you find all this out? Because there was a lot of other things involving documents and stuff that Benowitz had. They said, I got it from Bill Moore. And so, of course, Bill Moore was one of Doty's agents. Doty was his handler. You see, you, you, we ex you get ex it's weird that we live in this world now, in this, in this community of ufology, where everybody's accusing everyone else of being, of being a shell. You know, accusations of government aid, being government agents are just like, it, it's internecine. It's kind of pan mixia of suspicion and paranoia. And there's some people like who just do it all the time to everyone. Richard D. Hall, of course, is one of these people. And there's others who, who unlike Richard, don't do any serious research. They, they simply dedicate their entire, every, every moment of their time to this. You know, there's people that basically, the shit, I call the, the shill hunters, the shill squad. You've seen my videos on this subject. They literally do nothing else. And, um,. There's an entire cottage industry of, of shill hunters now. And this has a very detrimental effect because people like Doty go under the radar. When I think people like Doty operate with, more easily in such an environment because his, his signal was lost in the noise. When a real shill comes along, people don't really react. Doty is, is proven to be a shill. He was caught red-handed and he's confessed. So when I say he was, when I say he was Bill Moore's handler, it's not just the usual kind of silly accusation. It's actually true because he said because we found out, and Bill Moore confessed as well. Um, so Doty was angry with Bill, Bill, Bill Moore, and said, "You know, what are you doing, talking to Paul Benowitz about this? Because you're not supposed to." What I'm, I'm surprised at this actually because you you don't have to be an expert in espionage. In fact, you only have to read a bit of John Le Carré to realise that. Um, why why did Doty brief Bill Moore into this? And funny enough, they called it Operation Seven Lambs, this counter this this COINTEL pro job against Paul Benowitz. Uh, Operation Seven Lambs. Is that kind of a demeaning way of saying that Doty had seven agents now, like little lambs? I don't know. Who I wonder who the other agents were. Um anyway, um the question you see, he was angry with with but it, let me clarify, Doty was angry with Bill Moore for telling Benowitz <coughs> about Operation Seven Lambs. But why did Doty tell Bill Moore about Seven Operation Seven Lambs? Surely Moore's just like an agent. He's just he, or, he shouldn't know anything more than he needs to know. So how did he know? That's an, it's like that satellite thing at Kirtland. It's another hole in, in Doty's story. It doesn't quite make sense. Anyway, this this sordid affair came to an end by the by 1989. Bill Moore confessed. Doty was he was denounced by the Benowitz family, quite understandably, and by the UFO community, understandably. And then here we are. All right, it's a long time later. But here he is now appearing at, at UFO. He, he appears at UFO conferences all over the world. He has been doing it now for you know ten years or more. Look at his background here. He says, 
He was. Um, he comes from a military family. He, all his family were in the Air Force. Not only that, but they were in Air Force intelligence. His father was a World War II fighter pilot who then went into intelligence and late in World War II and continued in the Cold War. His uncle, what's his, his uncle did something, what was his uncle? Um, his, oh, his uncle was in Project Blue Book. <laughs> he couldn't make it up. Uh, he worked under Heineck. I've got a mess, I think that's from Taj. Worked for Heineck, can you believe it? On my way, all right, okay. I'll just reply to him. Um, you honestly, you couldn't. You honestly couldn't make it up. I'm just time getting ready. There we go. This is all live live action here for this. Um, <clears throat> the question is like, um, and then Doty. Funny for you, Doty also. What he did after he left the military was he he went to he got an education, and then he he worked for a company. He, he worked for a company run by by Hal Puthoff, who at the time uh, was working for the CIA. Well, some people claim he still is. There's a long history. These things go back fifty years, more, sometimes more than fifty years, and the same people are involved. People who've worked their entire career. In the same field, and you know how you say it, it seems almost unthinkable that people could do that. It's almost like they well, people don't live that long; they'd be too old. But they're not. You see, they start when they're young, and they're still doing it when they're old. Hal put up. There's some. We, I actually saw some images on. They showed, showed little clips from Gaia TV. That Uri Geller. There's a program with Uri Geller, and of course he was in 1972. He was investigated by Stanford Research Institute. That's before many, many people watching this were alive. This video, many many of my viewers weren't alive then, and you see a young Hal put off with Russell Targ investigating Uri Geller. He was then recruited to the CIA and um, you know and things like that. And now Uri now put off is now an old man, and he's and he's now with TTSA. And people are quite rightly saying, well, is that isn't that a bit dodgy? Shouldn't we be a bit, be a bit suspicious about that? And indeed, yes, we should. So the question is. Oh, then, then after put off, he then went and worked for Medra and Gaia. He worked. He, then Doty went and worked in the media, and he's currently with Gaia TV. Um, this is not a reason not to watch Gaia, by the way. This is also I'm not I'm not advocating that Doty be banned from conferences. I I believe in free speech. I'm I no more advocate for Richard Doty to be banned from a conference than I was I was banned from Outer Limits magazine. I I'm against banning people from conferences unless they are truly anti-social and, and a liability in that respect you don't want to you don't want someone at a conference they're going to go around shouting and punching people and throwing chairs around and things like that but if they don't do that as I proved I don't do at out limits there's no justification for buying them but personally I don't believe a word Richard Doty says I if I met the guy, I didn't get the chance to speak to him. I saw him a couple of times. I was close to him. I didn't speak to him. I stood and listened. If I spoke to him, I'd be polite to him. I'd be friendly. I'd be polite. But I would take everything he said with a huge pinch of salt. And, of course, if he came up, I don't think he would do this. If he came up and um, sort of started making offers to me, you know, hey Ben, you know, I could, you could, you want to, I've got some ideas for you, I'd, I would say not a chance. So, I'm not, I'm not against them being at conferences, but I do, people, people like, like, flocking around him, I don't, I mean, I don't know what these, I don't know what's going through these people's heads, do they feel as suspicious as I, as I do? Are they cynical and, and sceptical with, with a small C? As I was, hmm. not sure. Anyway, I may I may say a little bit more about this before the end of the video. Oh, on my way back with Taj, but that's my assessment of the Richard Doty talk and Richard Doty generally. Right, guys, it's souvenirs time again, and um, yeah, I didn't. 
I didn't take my transgender TR3B bedspread to uh, to Blackpool with me. I'm, I am doing this at home. I am doing it later than I normally would because I didn't have time when I was there. But anyway, let's go through the souvenirs. The, I've got this one first of all. This is this is from UAP Media. I picked this up on the UAP Media store. Yeah, they're not anti Elizondo, which is good. Um, that's a sticker. Oh, these are the, there's some free stickers given to me by the Gaia TV guy. Beyond Belief, that's one of the shows on Gaia. So I'll, I'll find somewhere to stick that. I'm collecting these stickers. Is it the one? Oh, it's one of the, is it the ones you stick on a window? One of you, oh, good, you stick it on the outside. Oh, good. Phenomenology. Video. Com. Phenomenology. An international team of UAP investigators that explore ancient light phenomena on the Colombian Andes. Disclosure team. Oh, that UFO podcast. Do listen to that if you haven't listened to it already. It's a very, very good show. Um, disclosure team. Here is the disclosure team. There we are. You can get all the details for that. Yeah, these are good. This is. Oh, this is a crop circle. This is a, this. I picked this up off the guy. Oh, again, the guy at TV stall. Um, yeah. Amazing what two old guys with a with some planks can do, isn't it? Um, that's a bottle of moisturiser. I used the big one again. Um, this is another. Gaia TV. This is Truth Hunter from Gaia um, by Linda Moulton Howe. Yeah, yes, that's right. And um, this is um, the was it the the Lamarck Zodiac as above, so below. And there's the details there. Catherine Preston. It must be a book. Right. This is a book of artwork here. Seven art. And there's some lovely pictures there. Reminds you of the Wing Makers. I'm going to go through these things. Oh, Stonehenge. Look, I bet Maria Wheatley likes that. Easter Island. Um, that's that one there. Ra. And it may be a self-portrait of the artist. I don't know. Um, now, this is my Roswell. This is my Roswell hat. I bought this off the off, the, off Chris and Pandora's store. Roswell. 75 years of secrecy. 1947. I could, I, I could not possibly say no to that, could I? Because, of course, it is set the 75th anniversary in July, and I'll be doing a Panmo TV special for that, you can be sure. That is my toothbrush. That is my pen. This is um, 14 times. Um, I've got to thank the person who sent me this. Someone's passing their old copies on to me. That's uh, FT4, like May 2020. That's just something to read, but I didn't have time to read. And um, this is UAP Media. It's their card there. You see, there's the... You can... There's the... Um, see there is the QR code that here this here is my which charger is this it's my laptop charger um, this here is my camera charger which didn't work it seems to have broken down but luckily I've got my phone charger here, which also works on my camera as you can see it's got the old camera attachment still on it um, that is my notebook notes from 2021 That's Filled out quickly. That is an MP3 player which I never used, but I've got, I've got some audio to listen to on there, radio shows and stuff like that. And um, that's a plastic bag. This is another plastic bag. What's in it? There's something inside it. What is it then? What's inside it? It is Night People by Paul Sinclair. Yeah, I, as you know, I was going to get him to sell me one at Hull, but then he'd have had to sign it in my fake name. From the author of the truth, yeah, and this is about his own experiences. Now, someone who suffers from sleep paralysis, I'm very interested to read this. And there's some, there's a few, there's a few endorsements, including from Robbie Williams, who is a, who's a rock star, very much on our side. Um, this, oh, here's my, here is my program, Expo 2022. Yeah, there's Giorgio and EVD, and here we got. I'll just, I owe Maria, Maria Weekly. That was the only signature I got, but you know, I didn't. It doesn't bother me. I don't like too much signatures, but. Stonehenge, there's um, this is um, Jock Theresa Bullard White. This one was the one I just saw was Andrew Collins, and there we have Billy Carson. Um, and there's some ads on YouTube channels. I've got a, certainly, I think I'm subbed to all those already. Richard Doty projects, all oh, right. That is that could be real, you know. You've seen Andrew Johnson's video on that. Yeah, that's Richard Doty. That's what he, Ollie's got like what could be a real video, a real picture in Richard Doty's <laughs> page, you know. And you know the irony, I think, of that. Oh, and here is Hugh Newman. Yeah, it's like, it's got, brilliant. This is a limited edition, proper one. This is Andrew Goff. Oh, there's the Green Children. That's, oh, that's Woolpit. You know, Duncan Lunan did a thing about that. Yeah. Funny enough, George Sukas mentions Duncan. Was it, I think it was, uh, was it, uh, 
It might have been Andrew who mentioned Duncan Luna, and someone did. Brian Allen, Steve Mayer, all right, there's Project Doorway. Brian Allen, good old Scottish guy I know. I saw him there, Paul Sinclair. Location is key. Johnny Enoch, the guy I felt a bit embarrassed because I, I knew him, but I didn't know when I saw him. Very embarrassing, that, but, the, uh, but that looks good. And um, Barry Fitzgerald, and of course EVD himself, star of the show. And of course, Giorgio. And, oh, that's next year's. Check that out. Mary Waddle's going to be there. Lou Elizondo, Daryl Sims, and Jimmy Church. Oh, John Enoch's going to be there too. Right, this is another FT, and this is the, this is the most recent one here, eh? June 2022. There we are. And um, there's some more stuff here. Though this is my laptop, which I didn't really do much with because might as well have left it at home. Disclosure team, yeah. I've got to, I think I'm already probably already subbed to them on, on social media. And we have a mysterious universe conference. All right. I think I showed you Maria was talking about this. She has Maria presenting it. If I can get to that, I will. It looks good. Someone else recommended that to me, actually. Or was it a different one? It was a different one with um, Thomas Sheridan. And that's my razor. I don't know why I brought my razor with me. Um, you know, I need to dress up. Oh, well. Not to worry. I'm better smart than... Better look smart than not smart at all, I say. So those, those are my souvenirs for this particular adventure. Okay, guys, we're heading back. We're leaving Blackpool now. Seems ages ago we arrived. Right? Seems ages ago we arrived. It was only, Continue straight. It was only a few days ago. Um, as you can see, the, it's, the well, it's raining. The, the bad weather has held off, just for us. Well, it, it rained a little bit, but I mean, it's now raining properly, and it's like, you know, well, that was very pleasant, wasn't it, Taj? How are you? Are you okay, mate? Tired, but yeah, okay. It's been quite a weekend, hasn't it? Yeah. Definitely. Well, the rain has stopped. It's, it was really heavy for a while, and uh, we could hardly see a thing out the window. It's like, uh, Taj was doing his best to navigate his way through it, the steady hands on the wheel. But it's like, a, it's like clouds of, you know, it's like clouds of... Rainwater comes up off the road. There's almost as much rain coming up from underneath as there is from above, like Forrest Gump said. So, um, yeah, it's all gone now. Okay, guys, we're on the M40 now. It's the last stage home from Birmingham to Oxford, and I um, just wanted to have a word with uh, Tadjit. What did you? How did you get on? What did you think of the conference, Taj? Yeah, it was good. Um, I particularly like Billy Carson. Yeah. He got an award. That was a surprise. Uh, Saturday night. Mm. Uh, Galactic Citizen Award. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it was quite interesting. I like Maria as well. I always like Maria. Yeah. Maria Wheatley. Uh, Richard Doty was okay, but the presentation he gave I already knew. I already knew that story, so. Wasn't anything new. No. So being a bit of new info, but yeah, it wasn't anything new there. No. Well, it's, uh, it's a, well, it's still the, good. Yeah. On the negative side, you know, he, I think I don't trust OT. He talked about um, Kirtland Air Force Base. He said there was a, a, a land-based satellite, anti-satellite laser. I can't find any reference to that anywhere, unless it's still classified for some reason. But it's back in the 80s. You know, um, Has it been that's why you can talk about it. So. Yeah, exactly. He's talking about it, and um, so yeah, I mean, I've already given I've already given my, my opinion on Richard Doty earlier. But uh, Maria, you're right. About Maria did come out with some new information. Um, I didn't know about the metal plate attached to Stonehenge. Did you heard that back before? That's no. no, I don't heard that. Before. Yeah. The metal plate. Um, presumably, it's like. It had some kind of purpose, maybe it had something written in some ancient script. But um, the point is, obviously, that like Michael Cree both says, you know, we, our past is being taken away from us. It's like, um, I think, do you think we're giving, we're giving a false impression of the past? And if so, why do you think that is? Uh, what do you mean about Stonehenge or just Yeah, about gen well, generally, you know, about, well, this is a part of it, Stonehenge is a part of it. Yeah, I mean, people say we don't know what Stonehenge is for or what it's about. And she was talking about when it was like rebuilt or something, repaired or whatever, back in the, what was it, 
twenties or thirties or something. Yeah. They changed the orientation of some of the stones. Mm. It was moved. Everything was moved around. Yeah, everything um, was moved around. Yeah. The original monument looked very different. Um, yeah. Makes you wonder. Just why is that? She showed us a drawing of the actual what it would have looked like when mm. it was originally built, and most of that's gone. I mean, some, over the years, stowed different, some of the stones have been taken away and, and broken up for building material. One was filled with concrete, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... They damaged it when they were moving it, so they filled it with concrete. Yeah, they shot it, which crazy. But Maria was saying that they, excuse me, this hole which had the heat water coming out of it, that was, that was, that was filled with cement. They just, like, plugged it up. So people can't use it. Um, it's, um, maybe... It, Big farmer are a bit worried, you know, that if there was this, um, if there was this hole which water, healing water came out of, you know, they might not be able to sell their latest drug. Do you reckon that? Um, it could be. Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, the whole English heritage thing is a bit. Uh, don't really trust any of those people really. But, you know, hide stuff and lie about stuff. Yeah. English heritage is maybe. Uh, it's like maybe an Orwellian word, actually. English heritage, maybe. It's, it's, uh, it's something, or it's like, uh, you know, the Ministry of English Heritage, something like that. As for Billy Carson, you know, I mean, he's got his Galactic Citizen Award now, which means when the Zetas invade, you know, he can um, put it outside his house so they pass him by, you know. It's maybe an idea, do you reckon? Yeah, maybe. But uh, he did do an interesting presentation on the Black Light Satellite. Mm. And I will have to watch his uh, documentary on that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that myself. Because, now, when we were talking earlier, there, if anyone could help us out, actually, because I didn't know it had gone, but there used to be um, a short film, it was 10 minutes long, which was about the Black Knight Satellite. And you watch it all, it shows the plot of like two conspiracy theorists online communicating. Yeah, sponsored by Pepsi. You know, you only find out at the very end. It's actually just an extended advert for Pepsi. And I, I mentioned this on a previous video. And I've done an article about it. But um, apparently, is it true that the whole, the actual full, the full video is gone? Is that true? I was looking for it the other day. I can find it on YouTube. Oh. There's excerpts, like when uh, the ush, ushers in it. I think the singer. Mm. That's on YouTube. It's only like a minute and a half. But the full documentary is no longer on YouTube. So. Yeah, it's it's a, it's it's a peculiar. It's a, if you haven't seen, I mean, I will. I think it's, I had a link to the YouTube video when I was um, when I wrote the article about it, which means I'll be able to find it. Uh, I will be able to find it if it's still there. Excuse me. It's a rather. It starts off quite well because it, it's about online conspiracy theory going live, and there's the Men in Black come along, and well, the government agents try and break down the doors of the people involved. And then there's this, then it goes very cringy because it's, there's a kind of, the black light comes to life and it creates world peace across the globe. And, yeah, and it says, like Pepsi. Pepsi. countries, yeah. um, I can't remember exactly what they do, but it's like flags and stuff from different countries all yeah. coming together from around the world. I don't really yeah, understand how it's related to the black light satellite. Uh, let alone Pepsi. <laughs> and they all sort of hold, people hold hands and look up at the sky to come by armor and, and um, you know, the, the moral of the story is, you know, drinking Pepsi can create a, a global utopia, <laughs> which is nonsense. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try and find, I'll try and find the link because uh, I do, I did write an article about this and I mentioned it on the video. And so somewhere on, on the Hapano archives, which go back so long now, I forget, even I've forgotten. <laughs> even I've forgotten what I made. I mean, the crafty nihilist actually remembered a video the other day that I'd forgotten. The one I made with Nick Hayes about the, big, the Bigfoot in Live Valley, um, and I'd forgotten about it completely. And she'd remembered, oh, well, she and he remembered, but um, I just, uh, I, I'm keen to, I'm keen to watch this documentary about Billy Carson because I thought he was. I mean, I know Stephen Camion's had a go at him, but then comes to get Stephen Camion has a go at everyone, doesn't he? Yeah, uh, pretty much. So uh, I'm going to watch this down. I'm going to watch this documentary. Um, and maybe it is like a, something from Bootes. He said it was from Bootes, which is a, a constellation, um, not Zeta Reticuli this time. But, uh,
Johnny Enoch was good, I thought. Um, I'm not really... See, I met... He recognised me, actually, when I was... He came up to me and spoke to me. He recognised me. It was very embarrassing, because I... Because I must have met him somewhere, maybe at Miles' event with Colin. Um, and I couldn't remember the... I think it was probably last year. Yeah. Kerry Cassidy's at the event. He spoke there. And, um, that's it, yeah, that's it. It's, it's the Watford event where I was... Yeah, I met him there as well. Yeah, but I said hello to him, and he's... Um, he was... So he was just in the queue waiting for coffee, and um, and he had this very attractive young woman with him, which I think is his wife. Yeah. And I just, I was polite, you know, because it's, it's one of these moments where I can't, where, where have I seen you before? And I knew him, and then I was going, because I remember, I remember saying earlier in this video, I, I, I don't know much about this guy, so it's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> but I sort of like winged it as best I could to be polite and respectful, but I found his talk really interesting. I really did, talking about um, the, um, the secret space program and stuff like that. Um, do you think? Do you think they really are uh, mining asteroids? To it's like, um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm still up in the air about a secret space program. I mean, I think there is something going on. They do have. What was that uh, hacker that found uh, the names of Gary so, McKinnon? Gary McKinnon, yeah. Uh, Non-terrestrial officers. Yeah, yeah non-terrestrial. Right. I think that's related to it. Uh, I don't necessarily believe all these whistleblowers who are coming out saying that they were, you know, part of a secret space program yeah. or whatever. But, but some of them are not very convinced. Some of them are basically just, you know, unfortunately, the lot of them jump on the bandwagon and they talk a lot of shite. And unfortunately, some people do give them a platform just for coming spinning in a good yarn. Um, but you know. There was this actual documentary about the um, secret space program, and it was a sort of sceptical documentary by this guy called Oki. Did you oh, see yeah, that? Yeah, I watched it. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, basically ripping on uh, James Ring. Yeah, and so, um, <laughs> Oki, Oki's sort of infiltrated this. Um, he's a sort of young black guy, kind of, I think he's a student of some kind. And he infiltrated the secret space program. I say infiltrate. He just he, he bought a ticket and turned up. That's not infiltrating. And um, but he came up with his own secret space program story. And he said by the end of it, he was surprised because by the end of it, he said I started to sort of like take, I didn't laugh at it anymore. I sort of like took it seriously. And I think there are people like that. There are people who are essentially fantasists. And it's a shame. And and I don't I don't believe. I, I mean I. Take seriously a lot of people who a lot of other people won't take seriously. You know, but I, I do. Um, there probably is a secret space program, but not necessarily the one that people think. Yeah. I think we have travelled to Mars and possibly even intergalactically, but not using conventional spacecraft. Yeah, exactly. I think it's probably be all portals and other interdimensional sort of travel. I think it's like, I mean, George Otsukalos and Eric von Daniken both came out with the same story, saying that the universe could be colonised with intergenerational starships, which would be travelling at 2% of the speed of light, and over 10 million years they could colonise the entire galaxy by 3D printing copies of themselves when they get to whatever planet they're going to. The truth of the matter is, though, I mean, if anti, I don't, I know, probably Giorgio and Mr. EVD don't really go along with this, but I, I think um, anti-gravity has been mastered by the uh, deep state, and once you do that, you know, the, you, the keys to the universe are handed to you, because you have an infinite supply of energy and can reach, well you can't reach infinite speeds, but you can reach the speed of light, or close to the speed of light, but very effortlessly. Once you reach the speed of light, you can basically go around the galaxy, or close to it, you can go around the galaxy because of uh, special relativity, the time on the ship will be much slower, which means you can reach the other side of the galaxy, um, travelling at 95% of the speed of light. It will take you 90,000 years, according to people on Earth, but for you on board the ship, it would only take a couple of weeks. It would feel like about two weeks. Yeah, you know. Know. someone was talking about time dilation, wasn't it? Yeah. Who, who talked about that? Mm -hmm. Talk about, yeah, time dilation. So you reach to the speed of light. Time slows down for you, but every, everything else just carries on at the same speed. That's it. Yeah, this is to do with you. Might be gone for a week, but it might be a, a year's gone by on, uh, on Earth. Uh, it's one of the weird features of the universe that was discovered by Albert Einstein. Yeah, it's um, 
I, I thought that, uh, that, was, that was very interesting. And um, what do you think about, um, I was going to say Adrian Gill, but what's his name? Andrew Collins. Andrew Collins and the... Uh, Oh, right. He talks about giants. He said that, have you heard about there being giants on the world? Very, very tall humanoids? Yeah, I've seen a few stories. Um, I bet there was one story of maybe the Iraq war. Yeah. Where they found a, they were patrolling an area, they went and came upon a cave. And this giant came out, like red hair, mm. maybe eight foot tall. But they did capture him in a net or something. Yeah, they, they actually, I've heard about story. It's Kerry. This was another of Kerry's witnesses. I think so. Yeah. The, um, yeah. You see, I mean, uh, there is lots of stories of living giants in the world today. I mean, what's his name, Marius Boyagian, you know, or whatever his name is. He wrote a book about giants of the Solomon Islands. I remember um, in the Nexus magazine had been raving about this. But these are guys about 12, 13 feet tall. You know, humanoids. Yeah, seen, like really old black and white videos of like a parade or something. Have you seen that one? Where's yes. Giant? Yeah, I've seen that. That's that's in Japan, and it's yeah. a, it's a, made in the late 19th century. It's, a, it's like a three-second clip of a video. You see a guy walking along. He's very tall. He's probably he's probably around that scale, so 12 feet, 13 feet in height. Um, and he's now this has been debunked apparently, saying it's it's a clip from a computer game. However, right. no one the actual computer game has never been formally identified. And what's more, the man is built. He's very muscular. He has he has kind of extra muscles under his like his armpits and things like this. And a lot of biologists have said that if a humanoid, if, a, if someone with a humanoid figure actually reached that kind of height, you know, 11, 12 plus feet, you would need that kind of musculature. You know, a giant would never look like you and me. It would, a giant would never have the same frame as you, a physique as you be you and me. They would have a very, very different um, body shape, even if they have the same kind of bones, which is just slightly larger. They would have to have extra muscles in certain places because of um, it's to do with the uh, what is it the the ratio between um, oh, volume and surface area or something like this, or, or volume and height or something like that. Um, so that's actually never been formally debunked, um, despite what the skeptics say. Um, there's been there's been an attempt to retrofit it. Somebody even designed a, a cheap game and put it in there to try and make out that it was uh, it was actually a game. It turns out this game was made after the video came out, uh, so it's been a bit of backfilling there. Um, and the bone, I mean, bones of giant has have bones of giant have definitively been found in Iraq a few years ago. An uh, archaeologist, his name was Muhammad Ali, incidentally, like the boxer, um, Dr. Muhammad Ali, found some graves in Iraq of uh, there were a, a dozen of these guys uh, male skeletons and they were about 10 feet tall and not only did not only were the bones there and they were estimated to be a few thousand years old but there was clothing there was eating utensils there was tools you know things that things like that um, of, of a similar scale I mean technically the, the tallest person who's ever lived was Robert Pershing Wadlow he was, he was 8 foot 11, he was just an inch short and 9 feet tall. He, he died when he was 21 years old and, and um, after a short life. Um, but these, these, these people in Iraq were a foot taller and there was a dozen of them. So it can't be some kind of biological anomaly. Have you heard of things like that? No, I've seen photographs of giant skeletons and people say they're photoshopped. Um, so that's the problem these days, all these photographs can be photoshopped. Yeah, so it's yeah. hard to say unless you have an original photo from before we had like digital edit editing and that kind of thing. I think it's hard to say really. Yeah. Unfortunately, in this day and age, um, photographic evidence doesn't carry the same weight it used to. However, um, and indeed, there are some fake giant skeletons which are photoshopped. And indeed, there's even models that predate photoshopping, like the Cardiff giant, which was uh, I think came out in the early 1900s and it was just a it was just made from plaster of Paris, it was a model, and some, but there are others that have been definitively found. I mean, in the Smithsonian Institute, there are skulls which are twice the size of a normal human skull that came from Nevada. And uh, the local Amerindians have legends of um, gigantic humanoids, gigantic people that lived in that area. 
and they uh, they used to hunt the it, they used to hunt the humans for food. They actually used to prey on humanity. So it's, any other speakers particularly you liked? It's difficult to. There's so much, you know, so much to take in, isn't there? Yeah, there's so much to take in. Okay, it's been a bit of a tiring weekend, I don't know. I forget how tiring some of these conferences can be when you're walking about and, um, yeah. and everything, yeah. We definitely, yeah. Uh, I just like, um, I'm still trying to take it all in, you know, so much information. I've made notes and of course I've made a video reportage. Oh, excuse me. I can't remember everything that I've been told. But, um, I've never seen Giorgio Sukolos live. Have you seen him live before, Giorgio? No, I don't, really, I don't really follow his stuff too much. I mean, I've seen him on Ancient Aliens and stuff. But from what yeah. I hear, the stuff he was talking about, it's not really believable. I think he's a, he's a vaxxer as well, so he's also he's telling, telling people to take the vaccine. He insisted on people wearing masks there at one point, I remember. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not entirely convinced he's a researcher. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's annoying when people do that because he did that. He um, he started going off on tangents. He, he, right, this is what it was like talking to Steve Bassett, because Steve Bassett is exactly the same. He, like, opened up saying, yeah, uh, the Earth is flat. Yeah, he says, the earth is not flat. For anyone who thinks the earth is flat, you can leave now. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not like, that's, that's not, so yeah, that's a kind of Jarrell White-like aversion, um, <laughs> you know, hostility. I wouldn't, they, I wouldn't kick flat earthers out of the room. I think they're wrong, and I just say they're wrong and leave it at that. But he says, there is the door, you go down here. He's got this Swiss accent. Um, his, his surname's actually Greek, but he, he comes from Switzerland. I've got a feeling, George, I mean, I don't know much about his background, but I'm guessing he's an early enthusiast of... Um, Von Daniken's work and he's kind of like become his kind of mentor because um, but he also went he started talking about chemtrails as well saying chemtrails? No, there's no chemtrails and I thought, how do you know? Oh. <laughs> you get, you, the problem is like you, you go off on a tangent and it's like um, this is the problem you, you start focusing on the tangent and you forget what he's I, I sort of forget what he's actually supposed to be there to talk about because he made some good points about his primary subject you know, he really did, and um, as I said about Von Daniken, you know, they discovered some genuine mysteries, but I think they just take it too far, and they don't, you know, what do you, do you think, do you think that the pyramids were built by aliens? Um, I think they were built by humans, with the help of, I wouldn't, I don't know if they would call them aliens, but some kind of advanced technology. Yeah, and that's what I suspect. I suspect, you see, I think the evidence that we were visited openly in the past is there, and Von Daniken has, and uh, Giorgio have actually located that evidence. At the same time, um, at the same time, you know, they, they, they've gone, taken that ball, they've run with it, and they try to use that to explain some of the archaeological anomalies. And these are um, anomalies of um, ancient signs of high technology in the ancient world and they've said well the aliens must have done that while they were there but it's more likely that the aliens the alien contact was transient it ended and um, what happened instead was an antediluvian civilization grew up independently and possibly used some of the teachings of the aliens but also maybe devised some methods of its own because one of the criticisms of von Daniken is he says he puts the human race down quite a lot doesn't he he said, come on, he, he's human himself. I mean, surely, you know, why, do you, why doesn't he sort of like blow his own trumpet and say, come on, we can build these things too. We're not stupid. What do you reckon? Um, I think we have, even now, we're being gifted technology, aren't we? So, from alien craft and so forth. You know, nobody knows what's going on there in 51 or other underground bases. Yeah. So, what's to say that we weren't gifted technology thousands of years ago? Same in the same way. Hmm. It is possible. It's possible that some of this is actually um, alien and alien art, you know, alien created by aliens and things like that. I mean, she's the same with free energy. I mean, free energy <coughs> technology has been gathered, I believe, 
from the uh, examining the debris from artefacts that have crash crashed flying saucers and things like that. However, this isn't the only source of free energy. Nikola Tesla um, was also a free energy inventor and he was 100% human. So I think it's a combination, personally. I think it's a combination of the two. You know, I don't believe we humans are not going to be outdone by a bunch of greys and mantids and things like that. We can hold our own in the universal rankings, I reckon. And, um, yeah, did you see any of that? Um, did you see Dr. Teresa Bullard Wyke? No, I don't. I missed a lot of her talk, unfortunately, because, I'm, well, basically, I'm some of those two guys, uh, Tim. Tim Wickstead, the guy, and his cameraman, Harry, basically took me to one side. They're doing like a rep their own reportage of this event for YouTube, and they wanted to interview me, so I, I did an interview with them, and that took up nearly all that time, so... <laughs> and what do you think of Paul Sinclair? Did you see Paul Sinclair? Yeah. <coughs> What's he talking about again? Um, the mysteries, mysteries of the area around Hull, including werewolves, animal mutilations, UFOs, all kinds of things. Did, did you see that one? Yeah, the, the, the recordings of the people who saw this thing. Uh, they describe it as a large dog or a large, but it stood up on its hind legs. Uh, several people reported the same thing. It was like, was it 96, 97, 98? Mm. During June, July, August? Mm. During those three months? But it's appeared over the yeah, centuries. It appeared many, many times over the years and centuries. Yeah. You know, he yeah. points out, there's even the, the place names of the local areas reflect the presence of weird anomalies, including um, dogmen. There's even place names which, you know, related to the presence of dogmen, which I thought was quite, quite remarkable. It's a strange place. Yeah. If you go to Bempton today, you're in for a big surprise. <laughs> yeah. Now, what did Barry Fitzgerald talk about? Do you remember? Barry Fitzgerald. He was a guy's up. He, he's that guy's working with Project Doorway. With oh, he was talking about the with Steve Steve Mara. He was talking about the they were digging up digging up strange artifacts in various places around the world that looked like there were sites for interdimensional portals. Do you remember that? If I watch that one, sorry, I'm not sure if I watch that one. All right, he, he basically um, said that they keep digging up these things that look like they're locations for interdimensional portals. Uh, just stone, they're just stone, but it's possible these inter interdimensional portals could be generated within them. And he brought up the movie Stargate. Now, um, Stargate eventually became a series, didn't it? Um, yeah. Um, it's worth it's, it's worth watching because it explores this idea of interdimensional portals in the ancient world that are acquired. Now it's a pretty shitty film, I must say. It's bloody awful. Um, typical Roland Emmerich, but it's worth watching. It's worth watching just for that. I think just for that, uh, just to get the idea of it, because I thought the idea is very good. There are supposed to be stargates, uh, like in Iraq. I think there was supposed to be one. That was the whole reason for the Iraq War, apparently. Uh, there's other ones around the world. Uh, yeah. yeah. There were yeah. yeah. several locations, yeah. But he talks about maybe a, the, that in the past, in the ancient past, there was like a continuous transit of, of beings from one planet to the next. And you could actually go through these interdimensional portals to get to different dimensions and or bypass space and get to distant planets and things like that. Yeah. Excuse me. Some. Uh, so that's kind of like um, so that was that was very interesting and um, it reminded me a bit of They Live you ever seen They Live? yeah it's a good film uh, there's a scene where you you actually see a kind of interdimensional transit service where people are literally teleported from one place to another um, and it, it's it, it stand on this pad and goes and they just vanish into space it's um it is a very interesting uh, film i mean you've seen my review of that isn't it for the review did you see the the couple get engaged oh yeah that was that was nice that was very sweet wasn't it? Yeah. It's, that's very nice you know um, but, uh, the only thing missing though is of course 
we're single guys, so we don't get any of that. <laughs> you know, that's that's life, isn't it? That's life. <laughs> but um, I thought it was very, I thought it was very romantic, and um, I was moved very much by the the memorial thing. You, you as well? Did you find that moving? They mentioned all kinds of people, the people I knew, like Ian R. Crane. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I used to follow, or well, still follow, people like John Deere, Jordan Maxwell. Jordan Maxwell, Jordan Maxwell stuff. I mean, I was lucky enough to interview both of them on my radio show a few years ago. Jordan Maxwell and John Lear. So, I was one day hoping to get out to Las Vegas and maybe beat him, but yeah. it's, yeah, it's not going to happen. Sarah's met Jordan Maxwell, so, yeah, last year at the UFO Mega Con conference. But, yeah, it's a shame. There's a lot of, I guess you could say, the old legends have all gone. Left, really. Yeah. It's, it's, it's true, and this year, this time period that they covered has been a, it's been a, um, there's been a particular cull, I think it seems. And some of them have gone as are very old, like um, Stanton Freeman, Leo Sprinkle. I mean, I came across, a, I actually came across an old poster advertising or a flyer advertising a UFO conference from 1966 in Nevada, Reno, Nevada. And um, of course, if I'd been around then, I'd, I'd have gone. I'm sure you would as well, but um, one of the speakers was uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle. He passed away last year. Um, Stanton Friedman, of course, I did a special tribute to him. He was a couple of years at, he was 2019. And this year, or 2021 and 2022 in particular, have been, it's been an absolute massacre. We've lost Ian R. Crane, who was mentioned in the, and also others that weren't. And, Possibly, I'm sure it wasn't a, deliber a deliberate omission. It's not a slight on their part, but they just maybe hadn't heard of these guys. But Gareth Davis, 53 years old, um, he died, and uh, Shirley Bolstock as well, who's a medium, um, and of course the late Kev Baker um, died at the age of 45. There was another young woman, I don't know her name, but she died of a similar at a similar age, which was which is sad. This is a great shame. But that was, I found that very, very moving indeed. It does. So, and of course, uh, we've had a, we've had a knees up as well. We've had, there's been a good social life here, isn't there? It's been, yeah. It's been a good community. What do you think of the catering? Do you find any good? I didn't really have any of the food. I just had the tea. And... Oh, right. <laughs> no. I thought they did a very good job. I mean, they had hot food. They had sandwiches. You know, reasonably priced and very nice, and they had cheap cups of coffee. There was a big vegan menu as well, because of course a lot, of, a lot of people who come to events like this are into the vegetarian vegan lifestyle too. Um, but I, um, I really did enjoy the food. It was very, very nice. You know, just, and what, do you think the place had a nice atmosphere and ambiance? We're nearly Oxford now, actually. So, but do you think it had a nice? Uh. It's okay. I know it's only being held here for the one year, mm. but I preferred the Manchester venue uh, that we went to in 2019. Yeah. I think it was just it was better because you had different rooms, you could see different speakers. Um, I think it was more more variety, and at this event, I think the speakers were a bit sort of separate from everyone. Mm. You know, as soon as they've done their talk. Or went away in their car to the hotel or whatever, but yeah. you know, in the Manchester one, you could see the speakers walking around and you could talk to them and everything. So yeah, it was okay, but I prefer the other, the other venue in Manchester. Myself. Yeah, I know what you mean. I do too, actually. Although I mean, I think the place did have a lovely atmosphere, and of course, I went to the same to the conference in 2019 that Taj just mentioned. And there's actually a reportage there, in which Taj appears. Actually, you can see him in it. Um, they, the good news is next year, in August next year, there's going to be another Awakening conference. It's going to be at the old venue, the warehouse in Manchester. Lou Elizondo is going to be there, and uh, God knows what could happen between now and then. It's 14 months away. I can't think that far ahead. Um, we, you know, I think we may, maybe we'll find out things about Elizondo and what he deals with, which will like, the way things are going at the moment. Well. Okay, we're now leaving the motorway to go into Oxford, so uh, 
it's been a long trip. We're nearly. I'm nearly home. Of course, Taj has got to go further. He, he lives in a little not far from me. He lives a few. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he's going on holiday to Corfu. So for him, the holiday. I'm, it's a, my excursion. My excursion is now over. Taj is just beginning. Well, I'm back. What can I say? I haven't already said. It's been a fantastic conference, brilliant atmosphere, a marvellous production, very, very um, upmarket, very sophisticated, you know, with so much, so much style, so much complexity and so much depth. I've had a wonderful time. It's, I'm glad to say, even though I've got, have got a bit of post-conference blues, it's not as bad as it used to be when I used to get post-pro blues. And indeed, I'm going to be appearing at another conference very soon, and this time I'm speaking. It's, of course, the uh, International Bases Project and workshops and so I'm looking forward to that enormously so do get to that if you can I want to say a big thank you to uh, everyone who's made this happen it's been absolutely fantastic you've all done a really really good job and you should be, feel very very proud of yourselves it's just so good to see everyone again it's like I said to Steve Mera you know we are a family now in the last few years as I have become more and more isolated from my biological family I think it feels like some people within our community have replaced that role and I don't feel bad about that at all. I think it's it's something I should feel happy about. And of course you have Panwo TV viewers, thank you as always for watching. There will be another video coming soon. Don't forget to watch Jacob's Ladder because the review and live stream and there's many, many other things coming as well. Um, I'm going to have to rehearse though for my next um, talk so that might take up some of my time but not so much of my time as I can't make videos thank you all of you for watching Hapanwo TV hospital port as pride and dignity stop the new world order <laughs>